Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll wait for a, a minute or two more as people are getting let into the webinar this evening. So I won't start for another minute or so. Sometimes takes a moment for all of the people who've been waiting to be let in. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I think we should get started and i know if uh, people join after the fact they'll be allowed to come in automatically so why don't we why don't we get started okay so hi everyone thank you so much for joining us this evening my name is megan hayes and i am the local history librarian at the shaker heights public library and tonight, I'm very excited to be a part of this uh, you of of the uh, audience tonight, as we all learn a lot about the life of Harold Burton. We are very pleased that this program this evening has been co-sponsored by our frequent collaborator, the Shaker Historical Society. And before we get started, I'm going to go over a couple of housekeeping details. Uh, you should see a Q&A &A, &A tab on your screen. Please feel free to submit questions or comments anytime in the Q&A section. Joe is going to answer those questions after the presentation. I will be reading the questions to him and he'll answer them. We are recording tonight's presentation and we're going to post it on our website. So if you know anyone who was unable to join us this evening, please let them know. When that recording is available, I will send out an email to all of the registered attendees. Also, after the presentation, uh, I will be sending out a link to a very short evaluation, and we would appreciate your filling that out as it helps guide Shaker Library's programming decisions going forward. So now without further ado, let me introduce our speaker tonight. Joseph Blake is a Shaker Heights native who pursued a career in banking and finance, primarily overseas. He and his family moved to England in 1979 and did not return to Shaker. However, he had a deep interest in Shaker Heights because of a thesis he wrote in college about the Van Swearingen developments in Cleveland. That thesis is in our Shaker Library local history, Shaker Authors Collection here in the library. And we also uh, uh, can uh, we are also linking it to it because it's online as an ebook in the digital collection Cleveland Memory. A couple of years ago, Joe did a presentation live in person for us here at Shaker Library on the Van Swear Engines, and that presentation was also recorded, and that is available uh, as a link on our website as well. So, in the evaluation email that I'm sending to you later on. I'll include links to both Joe's book and to his presentation uh, after the program. During the pandemic, Joe reached out and asked me if we would be interested to host him to do a presentation on Harold Burton. And what with one thing and another, including a complete library renovation and the pandemic <laughs> complications, <laughs> et cetera, it took a while for us to get it all set up. So I'm very pleased that Tonight, at last, we are making it happen. 
So now I'm going to ask Joe that you share your screen and we're going to begin. And as I said, after he finishes, when Joe finishes the presentation, he'll be happy to answer any of your questions. So please put them into the Q&A section as soon as you think of them. And then we'll take care of reading those uh, after the presentation is over. All right, and now Joe, if you wanna go to the front of your presentation and take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Megan, uh, for a very kind introduction. Uh, I think an e interesting point uh, to start with in this presentation would be to discuss uh, Harold Hitz Burton uh, in this way. Uh, my first memory of the Burtons is actually in kindergarten uh, at Fernway School about 1951. Uh, her, their granddaughter uh, was in the class and one day Mrs. Burton came to visit us. And my memory of her then was of a very tall almost regal looking woman, at least that was my long-term memory of her. Uh, and that memory just always stayed uh, with me. Uh, and hence, you know, later on in life, as you grow older, you say, well, now who was Mrs. Burton and who is Justice Burton and so forth. And Harold Burton is <clears throat> one of several mayors of Cleveland who went on to na national office. Uh, Howard, or rather Newton D. Baker did, uh, Harold Burton did, uh, Frank Lauschie did, Tom Burke did, uh, Tony Celebrezzi did, and of course, uh, the last mayor of consequence who went on to national office was George Voinovich. And Burton interested me uh, today to rediscover was, this is a man who did a lot. And it's almost like, what would people think of him today? And I came to the conclusion that there's a, a, a real, Burton had unique skills that we don't have today. Uh, he was a collaborator which would be a good way of des describing him. He was mayor of Cleveland, US Senator and an associate justice of the Supreme Court. But there's a lot more to the story because the Burtons are a very, very accomplished family. Um, his father, uh, Alfred Burton was uh, born <clears throat> in the Boston area. He uh, went to uh, Bowdoin College uh, where he was uh, Admiral Perry's roommate there. Uh, he was also the first Dean of Students at MIT uh, 1902 to 1921, but he was married twice. Uh, his first wife, Gertrude Hitz, uh, is a really interesting person. Uh, she was born in Washington, D.C. in 1861, not far from the Supreme Court building. Her father, John Hitz, was the Swiss consul in, um, from, from Switzerland in Washington at the time. As she grew up, uh, she emerges as a very strong woman. She's an early feminist. Uh, when she marries um, Alfred, they move to Boston and she joins a, a group that is called the Visionist Group. And this, the Visionist Group is sort of like the Transcendentalists who were a strong intellectual group at the first half of the 19th century. Uh, the Visionist Group um, <clears throat> is similar um, among its uh, members uh, were <clears throat> a Bernard a Berenson, the art historian, uh, Ralph Adam Cram, and Bertram Goodhue, both uh, famous architects. Uh, they are well known for their church architecture and collegiate architecture of the, in the Gothic form. Uh, in terms of Cleveland, uh, Church of the Covenant on Euclid Avenue was designed by Cram uh, and you know, is still a functioning active parish uh, just north of University Circle. She is, as I say, an early feminist, um, she is an advocate of what was then called voluntary motherhood. Uh, we would call that uh, Planned Parenthood today. Uh, she is, uh, like I say, she was very strong-willed. Um, her brother, William Hitz, um, is also interesting. His son, uh, Judge William Hitz Jr., was also a federal judge, uh, noted for his uh, presiding over the Teapot Dome trial of uh, Alfred uh, Albert Fall, who was, uh, took a bribe as uh, Secretary of the Interior and went to jail uh, in that infamous scandal of the early 1920s. Um, sadly, however, um, Gertrude um, had tuberculosis and uh, that led to her early uh, death uh, at the age of 35 in 1896. She and uh, Alfred had two children. Uh, one was Arnold and the other Harold. Uh, Arnold 
uh, was an architect. He's the older child. And Harold uh, was, of course, a lawyer. Uh, Justice Burton's granddaughter, uh, June Vale, has written a book about her grandmother, which uh, is, or great grandmother, which is called uh, A Passion for Perfection. And in that book, she describes her, two, her great grandmother's two characteristics as split between the two sons. Arnold has her aesthetic sensitivity and nurturing qualities. Harold, her idealism and passionate drive to make a difference. Uh, and I think that idealism is a very important characteristic which we can explore a little more later. Alfred married again uh, 10 years later. Uh, his second wife was Lena Yateson, uh, whom he met in England in 1906. She too was an author of children's books under the name Lena Del Keith. She and Alfred had three children, uh, Christine, Alexander, and Virginia Burton. Now, for some of you, uh, Virginia Burton may be better known than Harold Burton. Uh, she uh, is a children's author of some repute. Uh, she was married to George Demetrius, uh, and she authored <clears throat> seven children's books. She was also their illustrator. And one is, was quite notable. It's called The Little House, and it won the Caldecott Medal in 1942. Uh, I believe there's one also that's well, somewhat well known by current readers, uh, Mike Milligan and the Steam Shovel. Uh, so Virginia Burton, uh, also an interesting character. And there is a book by June Vale uh, about her as well. Now this picture um, is taken after they have re uh, after uh, Gertrude has died. Uh, the last year of Gertrude's life was spent in Switzerland because there was treatment there that we thought would improve her condition and prolong her life. Um, uh, Harold Burton and Arnold went to live in Switzerland uh, with her in the last year of her life because there was an extended Hitz family. Uh, that was still living in Switzerland. After her death, they come back. Now, Gertrude's mother is the elderly woman in the middle. That's Jane Hitz. She's also a very strong, uh, dynamic woman. Uh, this picture was taken at her home uh, at Hitz Point in Deer Isle, Maine. Uh, Harold is on the left, sitting in the lap of his uncle William. Uh, Jane is in the middle, and Arnold is to the right. Uh, looking at this picture, this is probably sometime around, I would say 1900, maybe a little bit before. Here's Harold um, <clears throat> on a bike. Uh, he's uh, got the potential to be a great gymnast, or maybe uh, he wanted to be a Tour de France rider. Um, Harold was fluent in French because he had spent the year in France in the, at the age of seven uh, when his mother was in her final um, years. Now, after Gertrude died, Harold returned to Boston and entered West Newton High School. And there he meets the most important uh, person in his life, Selma Smith, who would later be his wife. After high school, they really became, you know, a, a lo lovers then and start, began a lifetime, lifelong relationship together. After uh, Newton High School, he went on to Bowdoin College. And there he met Owen Brewster, uh, who was a future senator from Maine. Uh, Brewster was his roommate at Bowdoin. And when they graduated from Bowdoin, um, Selma by this time had graduated from well Wellesley. And at this time in 1909, Burton and Brewster uh, go on to Harvard Law School together. Upon their, their graduation from Harvard Law School in 1912, Selma and Harold get married. Now, interestingly enough, I mentioned Ralph Adam Cram. Uh, the Burtons were uh, always uh, Unitarians and the <clears throat> Selma and Harold got married at the Unitarian Church in Newton, uh, Massachusetts. And that church was designed by Ralph Adam Cram. Uh, Ralph Adam Cram started life uh, as a Unitarian but later became an Episcopalian. And many of his churches were of course, uh, unit, uh, Episcopalian churches. Upon their marriage in 1912, they begin a fairly active, uh, involved, uh, you know, on the go uh, 10 years. As young marrieds, they decide to move to Cleveland and join uh, the law firm of Selma's uncle, 
who lives in Cleveland. Uh, Harold had decided there were better prospects in Cleveland uh, than there were in Boston for him. And not long after they moved to Cleveland, uh, they go out to Utah and Idaho uh, with the uncle and they work uh, as general counsel for two uh, power companies, uh, Utah, what, what one became Utah Power and Light and the other was Idaho Power. So they're in, in frontier areas uh, in, the, in the early days of the uh, power industry and the generation of electricity out west. In the years between say 1912 and 1922, uh, Harold and Selma have four children. Uh, they have Barbara, who was known as Mrs. Charles Widener and William, who was a lawyer and Deborah, uh, Mrs. Wallace Abel and their youngest son, also a lawyer, Robert. Now, of course, as we all know, something else happens in this 10 years. Uh, they're moving around practicing law, having four children, but this is all interrupted by the First World War. And this is a picture of Harold as a, a first lieutenant in uh, the army in France. Uh, he served in a regiment there and he wrote a history of that regiment uh, that is available online on Amazon. I'll give you a reference to that at the end. So after the war, we come back to Cleveland. Now, <clears throat> this house is uh, their home on Drexmoor Road, which uh, they uh, li lived on uh, when he was mayor in uh, Cleveland. Now, Drexmoor, we always think of as in Shaker Heights, but as many of you all know, the whole kind of sh the Shaker Square area and the adjacent areas are actually in Cleveland, albeit they're in the uh, city of Shaker Heights School District. So many politicians gravitated to that area uh, for the quality of the housing and access to the Shaker schools. The Burtons did that uh, in uh, the early 30s. Now, this particular, in the, in the 30s, or the 20s rather, a lot of things are happening in Cleveland. Cleveland is a boom town. It's the sixth largest city in the United States then. Uh, the Van Swearingen's are developing Shaker Heights. Uh, they are developing the Terminal Tower. They are building their railroad empire. It's the roaring 20s. Uh, and a lot of things are happening. In that period, uh, Harold starts a private practice. He then <clears throat> uh, be, gets elected to the state legislature in 1928 uh, and would subsequently uh, become law director of Cleveland. Now, in the 1920s, Cleveland had a city manager form of government and William Hopkins was the city manager for most of those years. Uh, the airport uh, in Cleveland, Hopkins Airport is named for him. But the politicians, the city council basically, decided the city manager had more power than the city council did. So they reverted the city back to a, a city uh, mayor council type of format. And, <clears throat> and that started to have, that happened around 1931. So the, the first mayor that Cleveland goes back to in that time period was Ray T. Miller, who was the long-term democratic boss uh, or county chairman in Cleveland until well into the 1960s. Ray only served one term as mayor. He's followed uh, by Harry L. Davis. And Harry L. Davis is a, a name that appears periodically. He was mayor of Cleveland around World War I after Newton D. Baker. He was governor of Ohio for a term, 1921, 1922. And then he's mayor of Cleveland again, uh, 1933-34. And Finally, he moves to Shaker Heights and lives on Van Aken Boulevard uh, between Onaway and Southington. Harold Burton is his law director. And after he decides he's not going to run again uh, for mayor, Burton does. Now Burton is, by this point, has developed a reputation uh, for rectitude, both in private life and public life. He's a very bright guy. Remember, he went to Bowdoin, Harvard Law School, and he's a Phi Beta Kappa. So this is a very competent, hardworking, eager guy. Uh, he has this reputation as an independent Republican. And Cleveland's got a problem. Uh, obviously, they has high unemployment at the time because of the depression. Uh, and the mobs and the racketeers are still in play as this ad does. This was a, an ad that Burton had at the time or a cartoon in the newspapers. And so, the legacy of the of the 20s was a prohibition and prohibition created a lot of bad guys you know to be perfectly honest and somebody needed to take them on and burton was the guy to do this now giving you that context the next picture is elliot ness and harold burton 
And anytime you see Harold Burton mentioned, the first thing it says he did was to appoint Elliot Ness as his safety director. And Elliot Ness is the famous untouchable. He was uh, always going after the, 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 the bootleggers in Chicago uh, in the 1920s. Um, and ultimately, the, 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 the untouchables and the IRS finally nailed Al Capone and uh, he went to uh, Alcatraz. In the 30s, uh, Burton is elected mayor, and one of his first things is to appoint Elliot Ness as the safety director and to take on uh, the bad guys, uh, do something about crime and the mobs and so forth. And uh, he was, it, it did, did a, a lot to achieve that uh, at that time. Now, it should be seen, as we've noted, uh, that Burton did more than just hire Elliot Ness. Um, what we need to look at is some interesting things that were going on in Cleveland at that time. Uh, we, the city is going back from city manager to mayor. He's an independent Republican. But keep in mind, unemployment is at 23 percent. So anybody who's mayor of Cleveland at that time has got to be focused on how does he pay the bills? How does he help employment and growth in Cleveland? And one of the things that uh, Burton did was to get the GOP National Convention uh, in Cleveland in 1936. And there was a Great Lakes Exposition in 1936 and 37. So he's a booster. He promotes the city, gets events there uh, to uh, at least get short-term employment and uh, create a good image for the city. Uh, in 1937, there's a steel strike. And uh, Burton, uh, despite being he's a Republican, he basically does not permit the steel companies uh, to bring in uh, and use the docks uh, to bring in supplies uh, in order to so that they have a better chance of breaking the strike. So the steel companies are sort of hamstrung because Burton won't cooperate with them. And, you know, eventually this the strike is is, is settled. Now, Burton was also a, a strong supporter of the, the WPA, the so-called Works Progress Administration, and used uh, New Deal relief loans uh, to help the cities uh, at that time. Um, so he was, he's very proactive. And I think that we can see here, he's, he works across the aisle. He's a collaborationist. He tries to move the agenda down, to move ahead and make progress uh, things, not just little but little, but in some cases by major ways. We want to end on the, the note of Ness um, because other than you know be a, a crime fighter, one of the things that Ness did was to put the policemen uh, into automobiles so that, that rather than just be walking a beat, they could respond more readily and quickly uh, to uh, crime and, and the other uh, neat people's requirements for help that they would call the police or fire department. Now, an interesting thing is this is the mid 1930s. Um, we should mention that by 1937, uh, the, the New Deal had sort of peaked. Uh, 1937 was the strongest uh, economic year um, uh, for, for uh, the New Deal. It was the lowest point of unemployment. When Roosevelt came in in 1933, unemployment was around 25%. Uh, it came down to about 13 or 14% by 1937, certainly a significant improvement. Uh, but in 1938, uh, the situation reverses itself. Um, and I'll use that by way of introduction to what happens in 1940. Uh, in 1938, uh, you have what is called by the economic historians, the, the Roosevelt Depression. Uh, the New Deal reduced spending and <clears throat> the unemployment uh, went up again uh, to something like 20% uh, uh, again, 18%. Um, and in 1938, uh, there's this, be uh, there's a swing back to the Republicans. Uh, the Democrats between 1930 and 1936, every one of the, the four elections, they managed to increase uh, their majorities in Congress. In 1938, it swings back. You have the Roosevelt Depression, you have the fallout uh, from the uh, attempt to pack the Supreme Court. Uh, and in Ohio, uh, John W. Bricker uh, is elected governor. He's a Republican and Robert Taft Sr is elected United States Senator. Uh, and that's an important thing. Now, Burton is, is, is an independent Republican. He's not really a, a, the stalwart conservative that Bricker 
and tasked were. Uh, he's he's a, a diff, you know, one might, he's, I would call him a right of center person or center right might be another way of saying it. Uh, he's not the hardliner uh, that Bricker and, uh, and Taft were. And at one point, uh, 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 Bricker and uh, Burton had a, a, a conflict over the relief loans that Washington was giving uh, Cleveland. Uh, he, he, Burton wanted to deal with Washington directly. Uh, Bricker wanted to be the middleman. Uh, somehow they resolved that and the loans continued uh, to, to help the city. So it's 1940, Burton uh, decides to run for the Senate. Uh, he sees it as a good opportunity. Now it's good, important to know what's happening in 1940. Well, I think everybody knows by this point, uh, World War II is underway in Europe. So the big political issue of the day is not just the economy, but more importantly, to what degree would the United States support uh, the allies, uh, Britain and France, to what extent would be we willing to intervene in uh, this election? Now, it's interesting to, to note, and, and let's go to the next page and take a look at the results of the 1940 election. I call this ticket splitting. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what goes on. The Republican convention met in Philadelphia in June of 1940. Uh, the day that the GOP convention opened, France fell to the Germans. And FDR named two Republicans to his cabinet. Um, Frank Knox, uh, a newspaper publisher who had been the VP nominee in 1936, and William Henry L. Stimson, a longtime uh, cabinet member for, he had served for Taft and Hoover. He'd been Secretary of State for Hoover. He's appointed Secretary of War. So effectively, Roosevelt has established a coalition government uh, to take to lead us in the Second World War, just as the Republican convention is meeting. There are four names mentioned at that convention. Robert Taft, Vandenberg, Tom Dewey, and Wendell Wilkie. Wilkie gets the nomination, why? Well, first of all, uh, Vandenberg is a Republican Senator from uh, Michigan and Taft had just been elected in 38. Uh, Vandenberg and Taft were both uh, non-interventionists or isolationists, if you prefer. Uh, they, uh, but they didn't like each other. Tom Dewey was still only a district attorney in New York, but he's very important as that district attorney because by this point, he had put Lucky Luciano away uh, in, in jail. So that was his uh, claim to fame. And as we would later see, Tom Dewey is probably one of the single most incompetent governors in the country and, and certainly a great governor of New York State. Uh, but 1940 was not his year. So in the background, we have Wilkie. Who's Wilkie? Wilkie is the chairman of the Commonwealth and Southern Power Company. He was a Democrat turned Republican and he opposed the public power plants, namely TVA, uh, that <clears throat> the New Deal was pushing. Uh, TVA basically wanted to take the Tennessee assets of the uh, Tennessee Power Company uh, from Commonwealth and Southern and to nationalize them. Uh, Wilkie uh, did not like the price they were willing to pay. He took the New Deal to court. He got a significantly higher price for those assets and essentially killed uh, the public power expansion program of the New Deal in court. So uh, he was anti, um, uh, he was anti public power. He was pro uh, the, the Wagner Act or the Labor Relations Act. He supported Social Security. So he's more of a, a middle of the road. He is perceived, however, as an interventionist. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Roosevelt and Wilkie, uh, Wilkie gets the nomination on the sixth ballot. Uh, Wilkie's candidacy is really created uh, by uh, the Life Magazine and Look Magazine and the New York Herald Tribune. It's, it's a media campaign, if that makes sense. Uh, to, to, to understand that story. Um, <clears throat> and during the summer and fall of 1940, Roosevelt and Wilkie both play kind of a moth and, and flame uh, game with this whole thing. They're, they're both um, trying to, uh, anybody looking back in history would see Roosevelt and Wilkie as, as interventionists, but they, but they would send different signals uh, from time to time. And this would be classic. In the summer of 1940, uh, Congress initiated the draft 
um, the first peacetime draft in the history of the United States. It's going to be a one-year draft. And Roosevelt, you know, kind of holds back his endorsement. He lets Wilkie make the endorsement of the draft in late in the August of 1940. And then Roosevelt comes along and supports the draft. Um, and then both of them kind of play coy games about intervention uh, and how much they're willing to do. And Roosevelt uh, kind of boldly makes a speech in Boston in October of 1940, in which he asserts um, that your boys will not go off to fight a foreign war. Uh, there are clips of that speech, uh, clips of his, uh, of his comments and so forth. Well, obviously he, this was uh, directed at, at the, the, the Irish in Boston because he was concerned uh, that they would perceive him as being too pro-British. So that's why he made this, this statement in Boston. Uh, and of course, all of this works. Uh, he wins a third term by a very substantial margin. But now let's come back to Ohio and take a look at the numbers. Okay, Roosevelt beats Wilkie uh, by about 150,000 votes. Um, Burton uh, gets 15,000, 20,000 votes more than Wilkie, and it's just enough to beat the Democrat, uh, who's, um, uh, he beats by roughly 140,000 votes. Uh, so Roosevelt beats Wilkie by about 140,000 votes. Uh, Burton defeats McSweeney. He gets more votes than Wilkie, but who's the, the, the vote getter? It's Bricker. Uh, Bricker gets 1.8 million votes. He gets more votes uh, than Roosevelt, uh, more votes than Burton. And Bricker has a reputation all of his life as being a very strong vote getter. Interesting thing, despite the fact that the New Deal was, you know, a great age of democratic victories, uh, Bricker was elected Attorney General of Ohio uh, between 1932 and 1936 three times, and then he gets elected governor. So he's got the magic touch with the voters, despite it's it's a democratic time. Now, the four plus years that Burton is in the Senate are really very important years because it's it's the war. Uh, 1941, uh, there are three major, what we'll call uh, foreign or, or wartime initiatives. Uh, this is before we've entered the war at, at, at Pearl Harbor. Um, there's Lend-Lease, there's an extension of the 1940 draft, and there's an amendment to the Neutrality Act of 1935. Lend-Lease enables us to make uh, aid or give significant aid uh, to Britain, and to, to Russia, uh, we essentially, Roosevelt said, it's like giving a hose to your neighbor and then he'll give you the hose back. That was the premise of Lend-Lease. Uh, we lend this to you and you'll give it back to us later. Uh, the draft is extended for one year and the Neutrality Act uh, is an amendment that permits uh, the arming of commercial vessels um, in late 1941 uh, so that American commercial ships uh, can protect themselves against a uh, German uh, attack on the high seas. So it's interesting to note, there's three senators we'll just talk about here. We'll talk about Burton, we'll talk about Bob Taft, and we'll talk about Owen Brewster, who was also elected senator in 1940 from Maine. So <clears throat> Taft, being the isolationist, he votes against Lend-Lease, he votes against the draft, he votes against the amendment to the Neutrality Act. Burton supports Lend-Lease, he supports the draft. He votes against the amendment for the Neutrality Act. And Owen Brewster, being a New Englander, uh, which was all was much more interventionist in its outlook, supported all three of those uh, measures. He voted for Lend-Lease, he voted for the draft, and he voted for the amendment to the Neutrality Act. So that's that's their track, their records. Now the next two or three things are very good examples of how Burton would reach across the aisle how Burton would uh, work in collaboration with others. Uh, the, the thing for which he's best remembered is the Truman Commission. The Truman Commission was um, selected to look into wartime profiteering by corporations who were doing uh, defense contracting work. Were they paying, getting paid too much? Burton works is, is the ranking Republican on that committee. Truman is its chairman. And of course that work uh, establishes a strong friendship between Burton and Truman and would of course lead to his appointment to the Supreme Court. 
Uh, and it also would lead to establishing a strong reputation for Harry Truman, which would lead to his subsequent nomination as vice president uh, in 1944. Hill Burton is uh, the piece of legislation that for which Burton is best remembered. Uh, Lister Hill was a, a senator from Alabama. He and Burton worked together and passed a, a, a law that permitted uh, federal financing of hospitals for roughly the first 20 years after the Second World War. It also established standards that these hospitals had to meet so that you wouldn't end up with a duplication of assets and so forth. So Hill Burton, federal financing for hospitals, working in conjunction with a Democrat. Now, of course, international affairs, uh, the wartime represents what are we gonna do after the war? So Burton, uh, H2B2 uh, is a resolution that Burton worked on with three other people. Uh, the H2 is two Democrats, Lister Hill and Senator Hatch from Arizona, and the B is for Burton and Senator Ball from Minnesota. It was a pro-United Nations, pro-intervention. We should make a, uh, be a very proactive in after the war uh, in international affairs and to help maintain the peace. Now, it was a Senate resolution that was essentially um, outdone or outbid by Senator Connolly of Texas. He was the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. He wants the resolution to have his name on it. And essentially, um, he takes that resolution and Burton uh, basically gets uh, major portions of his resolution put into the Connolly Amendment. Now, an important statement of belief here um, is, uh, it comes out this way. Uh, Burton, I mentioned, was a Unitarian. And during the Second World War, he was the moderator of the Unitarian Church in the United States. And he made a statement that is a fairly strong, good statement of how he looked at the world. I regard religious liberalism as but another name for search for the truth in the field of religion, wherever that truth may be found. So he's a, a strong Unitarian and, and a, a national moderator of the church. And during the war, his office facilitates and helps uh, the Unitarian Service Committee uh, getting visas and related documents that they need to do their work. If you saw the PBS program on um, <clears throat> the USA and the Holocaust, uh, there was a section in one of the programs that discussed uh, how the Portuguese office of the Unitarian Service Committee was very proactive in 1940 in getting Jewish refugees out of Vichy, France. Uh, and other parts of Europe is one of their, there's some really great stories and personalities involved in that rescue effort. Now it's 1944 and we have this comment, dark horse, Burton is a dark horse for president. Now, how could that be? Well, in 1944, there were four names um, seeking the, a bit naming, looking to be a GOP nominee. Uh, Earl Warren had been elected governor of, of uh, California in 1942. Tom Dewey was elected governor of New York in 1942. Uh, John Bricker had been elected three times governor of Ohio, so he was a big vote getter. And Harold Stassen, who had been the governor of Minnesota uh, and was a young wonder boy of the Republican Party. Each of them had a strong uh, base in the party. Uh, Tom Dewey would, of course, get the nomination, and Burton would be his. Uh, vice presidential, not Burton, rather, Bricker would be his vice presidential nominee. But at one point, a couple of columnists started to say, what if these four guys all get deadlocked and there's no nominee for us? What are we going to do? So what they, um, what they do, uh, basically, uh, is Burton, Burton's name gets put out there as the dark horse. What if they have a deadlock at the Republican convention, kind of like what happened between Vandenberg and Taft, at uh, the 40 convention. Burton's name comes up as a possible name for the nomination. Now, of course, this doesn't happen because Wilkie, or rather um, uh, Dewey gets, gets elected governor of New York and, and he pulls uh, the, the nomination out of the hat. But Burton starts to make notes about what if this happens? So Burton makes a note uh, as to who he would have as his vice president uh, and he wanted to have uh, Earl Warren as his vice presidential nominee. He wanted Wendell Wilkie to be the Secretary of State, and he wanted uh, Bob Taft to be the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, obviously, that didn't happen, uh, but it's interesting to see his notes. 
uh, of, of what he did. Now, before we move on, we should make a little comparison because we've made a comparison already for, with Robert Taft and Owen Brewster. Uh, these are all people with whom he was very close uh, at that time. Uh, Bob Taft is obviously Mr. Republican by reputation. He passed two major pieces of legislation in his 13 years in the Senate. He was, uh, that would have been the Taft-Hartley Act, which along with the Wagner Act are the two basic most important elements of American labor law. He passed the Taft-Allender-Wagner Housing Act in 1949, which is the largest public housing law in the United States. Um, and, and he passed it with obviously Robert Wagner of the Wagner Act. A huge housing shortage after the war. So Taft got behind uh, constructing public housing to help relieve that. Um, Taft was an isolationist or non-interventionist. He was opposed to NATO. He was opposed to the Marshall Plan. Um, however, um, he, he did in those years after the war offer legislation for civil rights and aid to education. So you, Taft is Mr. Republican. It would be interesting to see how modern day Republicans would look at uh, his record as a Senator, given his support for aid education, civil rights, uh, and the Taft Ellender Wagner Housing Act. Owen Brewster um, is, is, is got a, a more a controversial record. He's, an, an, he's certainly an interventionist in foreign policy, um, but in 1928, uh, he was seeking reelection as governor of Maine. Um, he was thought to have associations with the Ku Klux Klan uh, and he loses the nomination uh, and therefore does not get reelected as governor of Maine. Um, after the Second World War, he uh, gets into a battle with Howard Hughes um, of TWA, the great aviator. Um, Brewster wants to investigate Hughes uh, and the famous Spruce Goose, which is a very expensive plane uh, that costs money. And, you know, would this thing ever really fly? Uh, I think uh, Howard Hughes flew it once, maybe a quarter of a mile. Um, so he co goes before a committee. Now, Brewster was supposed, was supposed to be on this committee and chair it, uh, but Howard Hughes very quickly corners Brewster and basically says, I founded TWA, but you are effectively the toad for the founder of Pan Am. That's the only reason you wanna do this. And he was able to kind of hang that on Brewster uh, and embarrass him. And Brewster then went on and got involved with Joe McCarthy. Um, but in 1948, Margaret Chase Smith was elected the other Senator from Maine. And in 1950, she gave her famous uh, address of conscience uh, on the floor, which opposed uh, McCarthy. Uh, and in 1952, uh, Howard Hughes comes back, uh, gives money to the governor of Maine to oppose him, uh, oppose Brewster in the primary uh, and hang the McCarthy uh, shtick on him. And Brewster loses the renomination in 1952 and uh, the governor who is a Republican goes on uh, to the Senate. Now, in, the, in, 19, in the April of 1945, Franklin Roosevelt dies, Harry Truman becomes president. By, the, by 1945, FDR had named eight of the nine members of the Supreme Court. Um, after 1938 and the uh, Supreme Court packing, various justices uh, you know, retired. Uh, and moved on. And some of them had kind of shifted from being hard anti-New Deal to a more middle of the road position. But the last Republican appointee by Calvin Coolidge was Owen Roberts. So in the summer of 1945, Owen Roberts retires from the Supreme Court. Harry Truman believes that he should uh, pick somebody uh, who is a moderate, somebody who is a, um, uh, who's, uh, uh, that he likes, and he wants a Republican. So he picks uh, uh, Harold Burton to go to the Supreme Court in the summer of 1945. Um, given the appointments uh, that we see today and the, the horrible Senate hearings, you know, where everything about you is washed in public, whatever you may have said in the last 30 years is dissected by everyone. Uh, Harold Burton was nominated, we'll say on a Monday, and he was un unanimously confirmed in his appointment on a Wednesday. Uh, so within two days, uh, he was nominated and confirmed. Uh, we have not seen anything like that in a very long time. This is uh, on the first day of uh, in the, in the October session. He's now a justice. 
Uh, and the quote on the top of the page was his answer to a, a comment from a newspaper journalist who wanted to know, so what's it like being on the Supreme Court? And he says, well, have you ever gone uh, direct from a circus to the monastery? And that was his take. Uh, I love this picture uh, because this uh, takes us back to um, uh, you know, Selma Burton again. Uh, you see that this is, you can see that this is the woman that I saw when I was five years old. And in this picture, she's obviously very fashionable. She loves hats. Uh, that's quite a hat, I think. And you see that belt on the dress and so forth. Very fashion con conscious. Uh, and she's slightly taller uh, than the justice in the picture because of, of the hat. Um, she makes an impression. Uh, you can't forget having met her. Um, the other personnel are obviously to the left is their son, Robert, who's a young uh, Marine Lieutenant. Uh, and having served in the Marines myself, I uh, and wore that same uniform uh, at one point, uh, God bless him. Uh, the daughter is their daughter, Barbara Widener. Uh, she too would seem to have her mother's sense of fashion. And in the middle uh, is Skippy Widener, uh, <clears throat> her son. And uh, many of us who are my age may well remember wearing similar outfits uh, to go to Stouffer's at the square or other places uh, that you were supposed to look like a young gentleman with your parents. Now, <clears throat> just one other comment, because I'm gonna now spend a little more time talking about, in a few minutes about Selma. I just wanted to add, uh, Selma, the other thing I always remember about Selma is my mother once told me that Mrs. Burton wore two earrings on one earlobe. This was sort of her fashion statement. Uh, I don't know that you can see that there, but that was what she was famous for, two clipped earrings on an earlobe. When he's on the court, um, his reputation, um, he's on there for 13 years. Um, I'm gonna focus on some civil rights cases because those are the ones that I think stand out. His uh, decisions on business regulation or tax related kinds of questions are the type of positions you would expect a, re a Republican uh, justice to, to take. Um, he doesn't like to see the government intervene in, with too much regulation or assert uh, too much authority. Uh, this was demonstrated on some cases uh, that involved uh, Truman's attempt uh, to uh, draft steel workers into uh, the, the, the army during the Korean War. Burton is a member of the NAACP, NAACP. but in 1946, a case comes up, Morgan versus Virginia. Uh, this involves the segregation on interstate buses. Now, it's hard to imagine this today, but try and think of a bus, a Greyhound bus, leaving Philadelphia to go, let's say, down to North Carolina. Once it went into Virginia, the bus had to be segregated. So a case came up and said, "This is un this is not legal for you to do this. You this is you know complete disruption. The bus gets to the Virginia border and it has to have all the passengers uh, seated according to uh, their race." So the case goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decides uh, that this is a violation of the Interstate Commerce Act uh, because uh, the, the Interstate Commerce Committee should regulate uh, issues like this. Uh, Burton dissented in this case, surprisingly, uh, because he felt uh, that if Congress had not given the Interstate Commerce Committee that specific authority, then they shouldn't be allowed to do this. They shouldn't be able, the court shouldn't assert uh, this power that is not in the act itself. Now that I think is Burton speaking as a legislator, having served in the Senate and having worked on the drafting of legislation, he probably had a view that believed that if Congress wanted something to be there, they would have put it there. You can't read into the statute what is not there. Kelly versus Kramer is particularly interesting to Shaker Heights residents, why? Um, in 1949, a case comes out of uh, St. Louis. Um, <clears throat> it involved uh, deed restrictions. Um, many deed restrictions in the United States had specific racial or religious exclusion. You can't sell to a black, you can't sell to a Catholic or a Jew or whatever group you want to exclude. A section of St. Louis had deeds <clears throat> that said you couldn't sell to blacks. A white homeowner sold a house to a black. A white resident in the area takes this to court and wants to assert that 
you, 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 you have bought this house illegally. You can't do this. This gets, um, the Supreme Court hears this case. They decide six to nothing, and I'll explain in a minute, that this is a violation of the 14th Amendment. You can't have deeds that exclude people by, because of their race or religion. But it's six to nothing because three of the justices had to recuse themselves from the decision because they lived in properties that had deeds that excluded people because of race or religion. Now, Burton obviously was in the six uh, and therefore uh, voted to uh, declare it unconstitutional. Why is this relevant to Shaker Heights? Shaker Heights deeds had something put in in 1927, the so-called Van Swearingen consent, which required the Van Swearingen company to give you approval to sell your house after you bought it. So if you bought the house from the Van Swearingen company and 10 years later wanted to sell the house, you had to go back to the Van Swearingen company and get approval to sell the property. Why did that get put in in 1927 as opposed to say 1913? Because a black doctor had bought a house on Huntington Road in 1925 uh, in, a secondary, in a second sale of the house. And this caused a great furor in the community, uh, a lot of disruption uh, and the black uh, resident was forced to sell the house and move. He was a doctor at University Hospital at the time. Um, the Van Swearingen's then decided we can't have this happen again. And they had all the properties redeeded with this so-called Van Swearingen consent. But because that Van Swearingen consent says nothing about race or religion, it was not affected by Shelley versus Kramer. It became, it's, it was long operative many years later. It just got rubber stamped for a fee uh, that was collected um, uh, uh, when you sold your house. So my mother sold our house at Shaker Heights in 1981. After living in it for 30 years, she had to get this, uh, pay 10 or $20 to get this rubber stamped consent. Henderson versus the United States is actually written by Justice Burton. This too is another one of these funny segregation cases. Um, it's, it involves uh, segregation on trains. A black passenger is on a train uh, that, uh, that, that's in the, traveling through the South. He goes to the dining room or the dining car. The dining car was supposed to have a segregated section for black diners. When he gets there, there isn't any segregated section for him to sit in because it's filled with white people. Um, he goes to court and says, I paid the same price of ticket as they did. Why didn't I, couldn't I have a seat in the dining car? Um, so the, the Supreme Court basically said, this is a violation of the Interstate Commerce Act. Uh, he paid the same price. He had the same rights and privileges. He should have been able to eat his dinner, period. Now, both with respect to Morgan and Henderson, I want to make a point because we're now gonna talk about Brown. A lot of these decisions would come down, but it, oftentimes the enforcement of, of decisions uh, in the South was, was very haphazard because oftentimes uh, the railroads were made by local authorities to comply uh, with whatever the segregation preferences of the South were, despite these two courts cases. We get to Brown, um, this, the first hearing is in 1953, uh, Justice um, Vincent, who's the Chief Justice, dies. Earl Warren now is appointed uh, the, the Chief Justice of the United States. He wants to get, take on uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, and he wants a unanimous decision. He very quickly determines that Harold Burton is his main ally to do this, because Harold B. Burton likes to work for consensus. He's congenial. People, he is a collaborator. So Burton and uh, Warren work together. They, they, they could cajole various members at meals and meetings to, to go along. And the two people who were the hardest ones to get to go along were Felix Frankfurter uh, and Justice Jackson, uh, because they, di they didn't like each other to begin with. And so you had a lot of personal animosities uh, going on there. But Warren got what he wanted, a unanimous decision to reverse Plessy versus Ferguson. Now let's uh, spend a few, couple of minutes just talking about uh, Selma. This is a great picture because uh, Selma and Harold represent to me as an outsider from what I know from my research and from talking to family members I know, they were really lovers 
it in the best sense of the word. And she clearly looks at him in this picture taken in the 1950s uh, with great admiration. And I'll share with you what one of her granddaughters told me. She played an interesting role in our lives. At different times, she was a wise guide, gracious hostess, and a stalwart supporter to my grandfather and the whole family. She was my grandfather's greatest fan and supporter. They were very much in love and expressed their fondness for each other in sweet notes. I think it was difficult for her to live so far away, namely in Washington, because she could not see her children and grandchildren. She would send each of us personalized notes for each small holiday and include a crisp new dollar bill. And of course, they always came to Cleveland for the major holidays. In the summer of 1966, two years after my grandfather's death, she arranged for me and my cousins to visit Switzerland. She and Harold would spend summers there visiting with the Hitz relatives of his mother's family. She took us to spend three weeks traveling all over Switzerland in order to introduce us uh, to all of our uh, relatives and friends. Quite an undertaking for a 78-year-old woman who was still grieving the loss of her husband. And now every four years, all of us Hitz cousins in Europe and the US gather to spend a few days together. I mentioned um, that when they would come to town, there was always these pictures in the paper. Well, here's of course the classic. I call this the baby boom. This is sometime around probably 1946. Uh, th they had five uh, granddaughters uh, born be uh, in between like 1943 and 1948. Um, <clears throat> so you can see the great pride in their faces with their grandchildren. Uh, this is Harold with June. Uh, June uh, Vale, a uh, mother uh, and lived with the Burtons in Washington in 1943 when she was born. And so here's June as a about one or two years of age uh, with her grandfather. Um, it, it, I thought this is a very touching photo giving a sense of who he was. Uh, here he is playing with his grandchildren, again, courtesy of the local Cleveland paper. Uh, the Burtons are in town, let's go get a picture. He is our most prominent famous citizen uh, of the day. And here we have five of his granddaughters. And then we have uh, them a couple years later. Harold's quite the, uh, uh, the, 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 the fashion plate. Uh, in those days, men would wear straw hats in the summer and white shoes uh, uh, as appropriate. Uh, so it was a very, very different kind of dress style than we see today. There was no, uh, shall we say, casual Fridays or anything like that. Um, and those of us who are my age will remember those chairs. Uh, I have one similar to the one on the right that my mother-in-law gave us for our son when he was born 40 odd years ago. And last but not least, uh, we have um, the Burton family in 1964, um, just shortly before the justice died. This is the whole family. This is what they would get to do. The whole family, the, the, the children and their siblings uh, stayed in, or spouses rather stayed in Cleveland and all were well known in Cleveland. Um, justice Burton, uh, developed Parkinson's disease in 1957. And he told Eisenhower that he was gonna stay on the court one more year in the event that there was another school desegregation case because he could see what was happening down in Arkansas at Central High and he thought that it might be another case. He stayed on the court until uh, the, uh, the fall of 1958 um, and then retired and Potter Stewart, uh, a fellow Ohioan uh, was named to the court. Um, he died that uh, fall. Now, we, um, here's a picture of Justice Burton. And I think the words um, stability, uh, security, and continuity describe it. Those words are in a, a, a book written by Professor Perry at uh, Wharton Law, or rather at Penn Law School in Philadelphia. Uh, that was how she described uh, the, the title of the book. And I think that describes Harold Burton extremely well. Stability, security, continuity. Um, he's a collaborationist. If I were to uh, say two more things about him, the politician that he reminds me of to some degree are George Voinovich, uh, who was mayor of Cleveland, uh, governor and secretary of state, or rather a uh, US senator. Uh, that was, he, you, he, he, he served Cleveland in a time of crisis as its mayor. Um, and he was well known to work across aisles, both as governor and as um, a senator. So Voinovich and Burton are very much alike. And we can say of both of them, the qualities uh, that they have are, are not very common in today's political environment. 
um, you know, everything is, you know, a death to the uh, every, death to the enemy, so to speak. Um, the other comment I would make is this, and it's sort of a concluding remark. Um, sometimes some people, including Professor Perry, will refer to Burton as kind of an overachiever in plotting. Um, I don't think somebody who had gone to Bowdoin and uh, Harvard Law and had a Phi Beta Kappa was, was, was a plotting person. But I think what they misread is that passion for perfection, the way June Vail described her grandmother. He seeks perfection. He has very high standards. And when you have those kinds of standards for excellence, you're always never satisfied with the product. There's always something else that needs to be done. And that is why I think in a way you can misunderstand him. He's bright, he's very articulate. He works so hard to get consensus, to get an excellent project. Um, I wish somebody would uh, you know, do a full uh, biography because I think he's worthy of it um, because his, his, his achievements and his personality and his way of doing things is, is so uh, scarce today. And last but not least, uh, here's four references. Uh, Harold Burton's book about his infantry regiment is still available in a reprint on Amazon. Uh, Professor Barry's uh, book about uh, Justice Burton's uh, record on the Supreme Court and in his decisions. And June Adler Vale's two books, The Passion of Perfection, which is about Gertrude Hitz, and her book about <coughs> Virginia Burton, uh, Folly Cove sketches. Those are reminiscences of her summers spent there in the 1960s while she was in college. Um, on that happy note, I've probably said a little too much, but let me stop and answer any questions that you might have. And I think I have to stop the share in order for us to do this. There we go. Hope that worked. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe. That was fantastic. Um, that was very interesting. And we do have a few questions from the audience. So let me go ahead and look at those. Um, one of our uh, attendees is curious to know uh, what type of WPA projects did Burton support in Cleveland? Well, I can't speak specifically. Um, there's a very famous one it used to be in the lobby at the terminal tower. Um, if you went down to the train lobby, down back at the end was a, uh, a mural. Uh, that was there that was built uh, done in the 1930s and it was a WPA project somewhat somewhat of a modernistic uh, style thing. Um, there are many you know these uh, public works and WPA project WPA projects tended to be more artistic public works tended to be parks the parks um, uh, are, you know a good bit of the uh, um, what do you want to call it? The, the, the lake, uh, the, um, <laughs> the emerald necklace that surrounds Cleveland. S some of that is very identifiably a uh, public works done during the New Deal years because they have a very unique style to them. Any place you see them in the United States, they're always stone and timber, it seems. Uh, they're very identifiable. So I can't say more than that. I'm, I mean, you know, I can refer to like the one in the terminal tower. I think uh, I, 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 I wish I could answer more intelligently. Uh, on that, I'm sorry I can't, but I would certainly go down to the Terminal Tower uh, or, or, uh, or Tower City as they now call it, because I believe it's still there. And it's there because of its, of its importance as a project. Well, I think that ties very nicely that the, the, the question I think is um, reflected in this uh, next question, which was just a curiosity about um, Burton's uh, willingness to reach across the aisle, which you mentioned several times. Um, this uh, person is interested to know, was, was that unusual among his peers at the time? Certainly we know it's unusual now, but does, was he noted, was he, did he, he, he had that reputation. Was that unusual in the Senate um, that he was willing, so willing to be, um, a, as you said, a, a, not a collaborator, that's not the right word, but to, 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 to cooperate with folks from the other side? Well, I think you have to recognize um, that there were very few people in the Senate who were Republicans in 1936, for example. Uh, after the 1936 election, there were 18 Republican senators. Uh, you usually had a middle aisle going in the Senate that just, just uh, that separated the Democrats and the Republicans. Because there were so few Republicans after 1936, the section on the side that was the Republicans was referred to as the Cherokee Strip. Um, because 
30, 32, 34, 36. They just lost elections. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who might have been presidents, but they all lost. Um, so by 1936 uh, or 1937 or 38, if you were going to do anything, you had to collaborate because otherwise you wouldn't, they didn't need you. So if you wanted to pass legislation or do something for your state, you had to work with a Democrat to get it done. So necessity is the mother of, of invention. And I think that this is what happened here. If you wanted to get ahead and get reelected, you had to work with them. And I think his personality was always that way too. I mean, you could see that when he was on the court, you could see that when he was mayor, uh, he, look, he's a Republican mayor in a city of about uh, 850,000 people, uh, three quarters of which are Democrats. There was only one city in 1940 that of the top 20 cities that voted for Wendell Wilkie. It was Cincinnati, you know, that large German population, hence, uh, they weren't keen for uh, going to war against Germany. Um, and Cincinnati is, at least historically, was much more conservative than Cleveland politically. That's the city of the Tafts, for example. Mm -hmm. So another um, attendee actually asked another question, which ties very nicely to this. Why was Burton a Republican? Was that his family's party? What, where did he start becoming a Republican? Oh, yeah, I, I think that he's a New Englander. He's from Massachusetts. Um, that that is culturally who they were. Um, I, I don't want to, and I think in many cases, you know, it, the, the Democratic Party was more the Catholic Party, if I can say it that way, because you know that's where all the immigrants uh, went to. Uh, he, this is a, I, I'm not intending anything. It's just how things lined up from a class point of view in those days. I mean, if you were raised in Massachusetts, um, you know, the big names. Uh, the, 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 the lodges, notably, or Calvin Coolidge, they were all Republicans. Uh, same thing in Maine. This was how they, I mean, a lot of that it comes through because they were abolitionists. This was, there was strong abolitionist feeling in that part of the United States. And that hung on a many long time after uh, the Civil War uh, in terms of their, their biases. And of course, you know, they're bankers, they're lawyers, professional class. So likewise, theoretically, they should be Republicans by the standards of the time. And I think B Burton was just naturally a Republican by heritage. Interesting. Um, okay, so here's another question. From... I can kind of understand that because I was raised in a family where uh, Roosevelt was the uh, was 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 evil. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you grew up in, a, in an old line Shaker Heights family, Roosevelt was evil. <laughs> so was the New Deal. <laughs> Well, that, I understand I mean, the mentality. That's, I mean, what's interesting is what you were saying is that despite being a Republican, he was supportive of the WPA and supportive of the New Deal. So that's, I think that's very- um, Yeah, that's, that's a, the practical time. necessity of also wanting to win an election. How are you gonna get there? There you go. Uh, so speaking of elections, another of our attendees wanted to know, did Burton pull the war into his Senate campaign message? Do any of the campaign material still exist in archives in Ohio? I would say that they probably do for sure, because um, the Burton archives uh, are in various places. Some of them are in Cleveland. It probably depends upon uh, which uh, period of his life you're talking about. Um, so yes, I believe they are. Uh, I think, you know, I, I can't say specifically um, how, how pro, um, how, how outspoken he would have been. I kind of doubt that he would have been overtly interventionist in 1940, because that was really not where Ohio voters were in 1940. Uh, I mean, Robert Taft is the other Republican senator. Bricker is the governor. Bricker is the, the big vote getter. So among, at least among Republican voters in Ohio in 1940, intervention is not uh, something that they're happy to see. That's something that those Eastern establishment types go for. Okay, here's another question. Um, so there's a reference to a specific event in 1936. So uh, this attendee wants to know what you can say about Harold Burton greeting the um, representatives in a conference in July 1936 of the German American Bund in Parma, Ohio. And there was a PD article covering the story at the time. Yeah, uh, you very happily sent me a copy of that. That's an interesting story. 
Um, Chris, I think you have to see, anytime you look at subjects like that, you have to see how did the Americans think in 1936? So maybe this kind of creates a partial answer to the question about 1940. Um, first of all, remember that Harold Burton is a mayor in a city with high unemployment. He's a booster. He's promoting uh, the convention for the GOP, the Great Lakes Exposition. Um, so this guy, and there were 600 people at that event in Parma. They are supposedly German Americans. They are not German by birth. They are Americans of German descent. Uh, in 1936, what, what is happening? We're about to go to Berlin for the Olympics. So everything is happy and uh, you know cozy and wonderful. Uh, and nobody's really thinking in the United States at this level very seriously about what's going on in Germany. A few people are, but not too many. And a good way to understand this is also, of course, Burton is the mayor in a city that is, has substantial immigrant populations. And the, probably the two largest are the uh, Irish and the Germans. And who is the most important German immigrant in Cleveland in 1936? Well, I'll answer my own question. Archbishop Joseph Schrems. He's the Catholic Bishop of Cleveland. He was born in Germany, brought to the United States. So he's a German immigrant. Um, so, you know, you, you, you're not going to see that this so-called German-American Bund is a reorganization of a, a bunch of German nationality groups. It's in its first year. Now, the best test to see how Americans thought at any point in those years is to go to Hollywood. In 1937, there is a movie, Charlie Chan Goes to the Olympics. This portrays the Germans as happy people. The cops are helping Charlie solve a crime. So they're not the enemy, they're Charlie Chan's help. However, it doesn't take long for Hollywood to pick up on what's really going on. And in 1939, we have a very famous movie produced by Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers led the way in really going on uh, against the Nazis. Uh, there's a movie, Confessions of a Nazi Spy, uh, in 1939 with Edward G. Robinson. And it plays to the German-American Bund in New York City. It nails some guy in the story as he's nothing but a German spy. Uh, and it plays, gives a very negative image of, of, the, of the Germans. Now, or uh, certainly of the Bund. Uh, more importantly, that movie led to all Warner Brothers movies being banned in both Germany and Japan and also in Latin America. So in a three or four year period, the thought process of, the, of what we'll call the opinion makers in Hollywood has evolved to starting to take a stand against the Nazis. In 1936, people were not thinking in those terms. So Harold Burton, the local booster of a city with a lot of, of uh, immigrants and high unemployment. He goes out there and greets them and uh, tells them that he fought in the First World War and uh, a variety of other things. <clears throat> uh, th th this is, you know, I, this is my job as mayor of the city. I'm supposed to promote the city. I would not see that uh, in 1936, too many people were thinking about that. Although having said that, uh, in that PD article, uh, in an adjacent article, was uh, some issues about um, uh, the, the, the trade with Germany and the Olympics. Uh, so, so, so there was some undertone there. But I think it's it, it fair to say Burton is not Avery Brundage. He was the guy who headed up the, uh, the U.S. Olympics Committee from the 1930s uh, on into the 1960s. And, you know, he certainly, uh, there's some, some things about him in that time period, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the Nazis that, that is not very favorable, quite negative, really. I hope that answers it. Well, I think I think you're you're pointing out that it really um, within a couple of years, every the the popular opinion and knowledge <laughs> of what was happening was definitely different. But um, so thank you for answering that question. Okay, I think we have a couple more, and please, if the audience has any other questions, you're welcome to still um, submit them. But I it looks like I have two more questions here. Um, uh, how did Burton first get involved in Cleveland politics? So we, 
you you spoke briefly about how he was uh he's, he was practicing as an attorney for a few years when he was first he, married. he was when, when when they came to cleveland they lived in east cleveland on terrace road and he first um he was practicing law uh, and he ran for the school board in east cleveland and then shortly thereafter um, went to um we got elected to the state legislature in 1928 uh and then i think this sort of evolution back to um a, a, a city uh, mayor or a mayor council form of government created an opportunity for him to become law director uh and then become mayor so let's put it in some ways i think uh his talents plus a combination of uh right time right place uh, got him uh, the opportunities okay um there was actually sorry i saw one more question which i think you answered but um you might just touch on it uh for a moment so one of our attendees wanted to know uh where harold burton lived in shaker heights and you pointed out that he actually lived in the city of cleveland but it was in the shaker school district and i was thinking as i was listening so at some point the burtons moved completely to washington did they keep that house um in shaker through that time period or at some point did they um, leave, i think leave at some point i think that was kind of a gradual evolution away he was went to the senate and he obviously would have kept uh, the Drexmore house during the Senate years because he needs to have a residence back in Cleveland. Um, a couple of the kids may still have been home going to school. Um, I think uh, the youngest Robert probably would have been in college at the time. So they, they had to have some kind of an anchor. But when he became a justice of the Supreme Court, uh, they no longer had a house in Cleveland. They lived in a hotel uh, not far from uh, the Supreme Court. The hotel is no longer there. It's basically a residential hotel. Uh, they ate in the dining room every night. So Selma didn't have to cook. Uh, you know, she's probably quite happy not to do that. Um, but, you know, that's that, that there was sort of a gradual evolution away in terms of having a base. Now, after he died, she did come back to Cleveland. Uh, and the whole family is buried in the Burton plot uh, out at Highland View Cemetery. Um, <clears throat> I it was thinking of, oh, I know, Jane Campbell, when she was mayor of Cleveland, lived on Drexmore as well. The Burton House, you go down Van Aken Boulevard, you turn uh, right on to Drexmore, it's the second house on the left. So uh, if, you, if you know that area, it kind of goes, weaves back and forth between uh, Cleveland and Shaker Heights. And there have been over the last 80, 90 years, a large number of municipal court judges who lived in that section of uh, in the Shaker Square adjacent areas and held office in Cleveland, uh, went to the Shaker schools. Yeah, because they had to maintain uh, residency in the city of Cleveland. That's correct. To serve That's right. Cleveland, yeah, but they wanted and, the Shaker and, schools. And you know, the, how that all came about is, is, a, is a long story. It's a whole it's kind other of a, presentation. Yeah, no, <laughs> another story, another time. There you go. Okay, we have one more question. Um, uh, so in your opinion, what was Burton's greatest political accomplishment? Oh, I think, um, well, I think uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of Cleveland, obviously, uh, it would be Elliot Ness, because that was the thing that comes to mind first. He is a, uh, you know, he, he improves the police department, cleans it up, and, and reforms it. Um, the, in the Senate years, it's the Truman Commission and the Hill Burton Act. Um, and as a justice, it's his, um, it's the way he worked to collaborate and to get consensus behind the scenes. Um, he kept a diary during his years as a justice of the court, uh, and he makes notes in there of what's going on uh, among the justices. That's why I, I think that's why Professor Perry uh, studied him, because she could find out uh, information about how the court was thinking. Um, and that diary was then included with his papers uh, for the Supreme Court. So I, if you're looking for it, um, I would have thought he's he's a, a compromiser, a collaborationist. Um, he's not a revolutionary. Harold will ne never leads the charge up the hill for something unique or new. Um, he's an incrementalist in the sense of Edmund Burke. Uh, you know, ch change should be gradual. He doesn't. He he likes to make changes gradually. That's that's very strong in his uh, opinions. In terms, he looks to to, to define a decision narrowly. In that sense, he is kind of like Justice Roberts, because Roberts has that same thing. Justice Roberts said of, of, uh, of one decision, 
you know, a answer the question that you've been asked. Don't answer a bigger one or words to that effect. That could have been said by Harold Byrd. Well, he was certainly present during a tremendous number of very important moments in our recent history. And That's right. well, yeah, definitely participated in those. Um, okay, so not to, uh, so we did have another sort of a follow up about the uh, where he lived. So all the way back to when you started your presentation, you talked about Selma visiting your kindergarten class. Do you know whether at that time Selma and Harold were still living in Shaker? What? No, oh no, definitely in 1951. Visiting. No, no, yeah. they were not living in Shaker. I don't. I don't think they ever actually lived in Shaker Heights properly. I mean, when Selma came Drexmore. back. I believe she had an apartment at Shaker Square. Okay. Um, but, until she died. Uh, so they they never actually lived in Shaker Heights. They lived in the Shaker School District. Right. And in 1951, he would have been on the Supreme Court, living in Washington. But she came back for the holidays to see okay. her grandchildren. So she was visiting. Her her relatives, her child, her children. That's right. All four yeah. of them lived in. Yeah. I think all four of them lived in Shaker Heights at one point. Right, right. And to clarify, yes, she never. They never lived in Shaker proper, but they they count. <laughs> 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 they were in the Shaker School District. Yeah. All right. Great. I think that's. Um, I believe that's all of our questions for this evening. So. Um, thank you so much, Joe. This was fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And, uh, and especially thank you, Joe, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you to the, again, to the Shaker Historical Society for co-sponsoring tonight's presentation. Um, all of the attendees will receive an evaluation email shortly, and we hope that you will take a moment to fill that out. So um, without and further- And just let me ado, add, I yes. will be sending those two books uh, that June Vale has written to you to Great. add to the library library collection. And, we'll put them and I obviously want to thank uh, members of the Burton family who helped me with photographs that are included in this presentation. Wonderful. Yes, you had fantastic photographs. Those were great. OK, so if uh, there's nothing further, I think that we are ready to close for the evening. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you again, Joe. That was fantastic. Thank you, Megan. And thank all of you for listening. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.